welcome you all this evening to the Southeast Asian Ceramic Society and National Library Board event featuring our guest, uh, Dr. John Itzik. We'd like to thank NLB for being our partner in this event, for providing the space and the personnel and all the technology, especially Mr. Gene Tan, who has been our friend for many, many years. He's not joined us this evening, but we would like to acknowledge him. I'd like to thank Alvin, who has who was our vice president and who has coordinated the event with NLB. And for those of you who are members of Southeast Asian Ceramic Society, please bear with me. For the members of the public, we are a group of collectors, scholars, and even dealers who are interested in studying ceramics found in Southeast Asia, that were made in Southeast Asia, or more likely in China. And you are welcome to join us for any of our events. If you go to our website, southeastasianceramicsociety.com, you will see the schedule, and I invite those of you that haven't joined us to come and try it out. Come to one of our pot clinics where members bring and guest bring items that they've bought or found, and we have resident experts who will help you learn how to look at them critically and even give you uh, an unofficial opinion in most cases. Um, now, moving after, that was our advertisement. <laughs> now, moving on to our evening, I am sure that Dr. John Nixon needs no introduction to everyone in this room. I will just remind you that he is the Associate Professor in Southeast Asian Studies at NUS and the head of the Archaeology Institute uh, unit at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, ISIS. He came to Asia originally as a Peace Corps volunteer and worked in Malaysia from 1968 to 1970. And then did his PhD at Cornell in New York on field work in Sumatra. His areas of interest are Singapore, which he is very famous for here in our community, but also he has uh, significant projects in Indonesia and in Myanmar. Uh, this, oh yes, please everyone turn off your phones. <laughs> If you have it, it's okay to stop now and have a look and put it on silent. Very important event that is coming up is a panel on presenting new work in uh, archaeological finds in Myanmar, in Yangon, on March 2nd and 3rd of next year. If you are interested in those areas, please speak to John afterwards. Uh, register. There will be a Singapore panel in July next year, the 17th to the 19th, at Newtown at NUS. And it is sponsored by the Association of Asian Studies. And again, John or Kiyak or anyone at, at SIAX could tell you more about that panel. And there's possibly an exhibition of Myanmar uh, material of shirts that one of John's colleagues will bring. So without further advertisements, I would like to welcome John to the podium and he will be speaking this evening on the subject of his new book which is available outside. Um, this is about the fourth talk I've now given since this book came out. Um, and so I apologize to those of you who I know have already heard the talk at least once about this already. Um, but I try to keep the of talks at least a little bit with them, otherwise I already get bored also. Um, but I've been talking to quite a number of different audiences, and it's a great relief after 12 years of working on this to finally get the book out. Um, because partly now I, I don't have to give the full background anymore. I can say, if you don't believe me, read this book. <laughs> and I can go on and talk about more interesting things. Like I can develop particular themes instead of having to give the whole freedom of role. I've done of course, a member of the Ceramic Society, since I came to Singapore in 
1987. Almost anything got co-opted under the council <laughs> way back then. And the Ceramic Society has been deeply involved in all the work that I've done in Singapore over the last 26 years now. Actually, next year's going to be 30 years if you count the first excavation I did at Fort Canning in 1984 when I was still based in Jogja Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, so I'm going to try now to make a little bit of a connection between the pottery specifically and the historical record. And because most people are more familiar with what they think at least are the historical documents relating to Singapore, although there are a lot of very valuable ones which most people are not aware of, which are not even properly translated into English from both Malay and from Chinese and other languages such as Vietnamese as well. Uh, but I also I gave a talk in Kuala Lumpur uh, a couple months ago, and I also gave another talk in Jambi, which was the old capital of the kingdom of Malayu, already back in the 7th century, about the connections of Singapore. How does it fit into this whole idea of Southeast Asian maritime culture? Most people think of Southeast Asia as this place which happens to be in between India and China, and is only important because it is kind of the place people have to go through to get from one to the other. Whereas actually it was Southeast Asia, which radiated outward a lot of its own input into the long distance maritime trade. Over the last 2,000 years, without Southeast Asian maritime skills, that maritime silk route would not have existed, or at least not until much later than it did. So rather than seeing Southeast Asia as a kind of a, this uh, open, empty space in between the two great empires of Southeast of Asia. In fact, it's more or less at the junction. It's a, it's a crossroads, not only east and west, but also going north and south. Mainland Southeast Asia was a very important partner in the long distance maritime connections, but so was Java, so was Indonesia. Uh, the, so the suppliers of things like the spices from eastern Indonesia were also very important as alluring people to stop off in the area of the streets in Malacca. But rather than thinking of Indians and Chinese, coming to Southeast Asia and stopping off, one should think of the Southeast Asian sailors going to India, going to China, and bringing the Indians and Chinese here, which is more the way it actually happened until about a thousand years ago. Only in the Song Dynasty did the Chinese begin to relax the old prohibitions <coughs> against long distance sailing and trade, and only then did, South, did uh, Chinese overseas settlements begin to appear in Southeast Asia. So looking at the area of uh, Singapore itself, of course, this is basically the area which is known as the Malay realm. And so I have tried to develop what I call a definition of the Malay realm, all of Malayu, on the basis of pottery. Pottery goes back further than language. We don't have texts from this region going back before the fifth century. So how can one um, claim that there was such a thing as a Malay culture when we don't have the linguistic documents. The pottery, in fact, although it's not an ideal proxy for language, does have a very close correlation in its styles and its distributions between the Malay area, which starts more or less in South Thailand, uh, almost exactly at the um, area where the tropical area meets the equatorial zone. Now, the equatorial zone is defined as an area between about five degrees north and south latitude where there are no more than three dry months per year. So in the equatorial zone, there is no real dry season. So that area begins at the South Thailand area, more or less where the junction is between Malay now and Thai, and probably in the old days between Malay and Molon, Khmer. And it goes down to Sumatra, all the way through Sumatra. And it uh, goes actually about to the south end of Sumatra and includes the west of Borneo as well. And then you get the transition into the tropical zone, which means you have monsoons. You have dry seasons. And this results in both very strong differences in the plants and the animals, the seasonality of human activities as a result. And um, also it's very closely correlated with language, very interestingly, and with pottery. You go north of the South Thailand area, north of Patani in that area, and you get into a very different area in terms of pottery distribution. You go down south of Sumatra into Java. <coughs> Javanese pottery is very different from ancient Malay pottery. So this area corresponds to 
an ecological zone, it corresponds to a linguistic zone, and it corresponds to a ceramic zone. They're all very closely correlated with each other. Um, now, most of the people who may know anything about the early polities of this region and the early historical records will think of immediately of the capital of Sri Vijaya, this a kingdom which became very well known throughout the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea already by the 7th century, already by um, 672 it was sending its ships to China and to India, and uh, the ruler sent ships on which Chinese pilgrims voyaged to and from India, such as Yi Qing, the famous Chinese pilgrim of the 7th century. He went all the way to Sri Vijaya on a ship belonging to the Sumatran ruler, and then he went to India to get the sutras on another ship belonging to the Sumatran ruler. So certainly Palembang for a long time was known as Tana Malayu. Now today we think of Tana Malayu as being the Malay Peninsula. But in the 16th century, Tana Malayu, Malay land, was still Palemba. And so here we are in uh, more or less the midpoint of the, the, uh, the roots. And in fact, in the 14th century, Singapore area was known as a division point in Chinese culture between the eastern and the western oceans. Wang Danyuan, who was this famous Chinese traveler and merchant who wrote the first eyewitness description of trade in Southeast Asia, now said that uh, the junction between the eastern and the western oceans was actually the Dragon's Two Strait, Longyama, about which I will talk more later. Of course, Malacca, Malacca is well known from a later period as the place which was the more or less the capital of the Malay realm in the 16th century when the Europeans started to arrive, but of course that was settled by people who migrated, according to the Malay Annals, from Palembang to Singapore, and then came to Malacca. So that is, according to the Malay traditional texts, the root of evolution of Malay culture. But then this writes out of existence the kingdom of Malaya, of all things, in which already was sending uh, embassies to China by the early Tang dynasty before Sri Vijaya, and where there we find lots and lots of ruins, and uh, it is, uh, well, uh, well, but is not included in the Malay Annals. Now, according to my professor, Oliver Walters, who wrote the, the early Indonesian commerce, origins of Sri Vijaya in Malay history, and then he wrote about the fall of Sri Vijaya in Malay history also, both books published by Cornell University Press. The, the, the Singapore period was a fantasy. It didn't exist. It's just put into the Malay history of uh, history books in order to cover up a period when Palembang, the origin point of the Malay culture, was temporarily overshadowed by Jambi, Malaya, which is only about 150 kilometers apart. So according to my professor, the, the Singapore period in Malay history is just made up in order to cover up a, per, a period when there was a slight shift of power within the Malay realm. But it didn't actually ever happen. So now according to this point of view, of course, this is what Singapore always had done. As a, this is a painting uh, done by the, well, the National Museum. This is how Singapore River supposedly looked in uh, mid-January 1819, just before Raffles set foot on Singapore and more or less planted the seeds of empire. So I started something from basically zero. And then before that, Singapore Malays would only have been pirates and fishermen. This is an alternative view which archaeological sources are now depicting of Singapore, say in the mid 14th century, is quite the reverse. Some place which is one of the more vibrant and busy ports in the whole um, Silk Road of the Sea. About the period when the, the uh, Yuan Dynasty was about to give way to the Ming. Well, actually, how already had? No, it's the 1367, that would be 1367, 1368. So, this is the alternative view of Singapore, which turns a lot of theories upside down. In fact, we know that Singapore was already inhabited perhaps 4,000 years ago. Stone tools have been discovered, not by me, unfortunately. <laughs> they were found at the very western tip of Sumatra, of, of, of Singapore, a place called Tanjongkara over here, which is, you can see more or less where Tuas is now. In fact, the actual site was just a bit north of where the Tuas Second Link is, which places it in the military reserve. 
so it's off limits to archaeological exploration. But these stone tools were discovered there. They're Neolithic stone tools. No, no excavation was ever carried out in Tanjong Karen, but Tanjong Buna, just across on the Johor side. The, the, the Singapore, um, the Raffles Museum, as it was known in those days, actually did an excavation in the 1930s and did discover a Neolithic period site. So people have been living on this island for 4,000 years, very long period of time. And hopefully, someday, that area on the northwest side there, which is all military line firing ranges and so forth, um, will be opened up to archaeological exploration. So Singapore has at least a 4,000 year long history. Now, to put Singapore in the context of this whole Southeast Asian maritime culture means, of course, looking at the range of over which this culture actually was able to voyage. And we know that it spread all the way from the Straits of Malacca out to Hawaii, Polynesia, Micronesia, New Zealand, all the whole Pacific area is populated by people who came from the Malayo-Polynesian realm about uh, 2,500 years ago. And so that is all um, populated by people who speak languages related to Malay and also have genetic um, relationships to modern Malays, but they also went in the opposite direction as far as Madagascar. Madagascar, the Malagasy people, are not from Africa. They're from Southeast Asia. Their language is Malayo-Polynesian. This island was uninhabited just like Hawaii until about the fifth century. And again, genetics has reconfirmed the, the stories that we can already tell based on the linguistics. So the Malays voyaged both directions, not just east into the Pacific, which is uninhabited, they also went west across the Indian Ocean and ended up being the first ones to reach Madagascar and to populate it. It's interesting, based on the recent genetic studies, we can now say that it would have taken about 30 women and their progeny to create all the modern Malagasy uh, population. So they basically descend from 30 women. <laughs> They're so getting that precise now with the genetic studies. Um, so most people know a lot more about the mainland Silk Road because of people like Marco Polo and so on. Uh, but of course Marco Polo, having walked across the Gobi Desert and so on, decided to ride a ship. He went back by sea. He didn't walk back again. He went by sea with the Yuan Dynasty fleet, which was going to the Persian Gulf. And so he describes going to the north tip of Sumatra, going through the straits. He doesn't mention Tomasi, unfortunately. It may not quite have existed yet. But he went and stayed for five months on the north tip of Sumatra. He describes the various kingdoms in Sumatra at that period. Now Singapore, even though it was probably inhabited 4,000 years ago, doesn't come into history until much later. But already it was at the center point of a very long distance a um, set of connections leading on over more than half the circumference of the globe. So until English in the 18th century, Malayo Polynesian was the widest spread language family in the world. Now why did they travel? What was the motivation for actually doing this? What was the kind of root of the uh, maritime culture of Southeast Asia which led them to do this? Whereas we know that there were other early seafaring groups like the Phoenicians, most commonly in the Mediterranean, for example, who may have circumnavigated Africa, but certainly didn't explore as far east as Southeast Asia. But um, we do know that already, for, uh, as late as the 19th century, there is still a very important segment of the whole Malayo-Polynesian culture, which involved long distance voyaging and trading. And this was part of a whole set of cultural practices. These are Eastern Indonesian ships in the late 19th century when anthropologists first began to study this kind of thing. And there was a very famous um, Polish anthropologist named Bronislaw Polanowski, who was interned in uh, one of the islands off of New Guinea during World War I, because he was German. And so he, having nothing better to do, wrote a book called The Argonauts of the Western Pacific, which is still one of the basic texts that we have to study as anthropologists, looking at how people in this little group of islands off the northeastern coast of New Guinea had this very complicated trading and voyaging system. It was a basic part of the culture. They did it not in order to get rich. There was no such idea as accumulating wealth, having investments, bank accounts, getting money. The idea was to get rich by bringing back rare and odd objects, curiosities. 
go somewhere and bring back some proof that you had done something that most people could not do. That you had enough gumption, you had enough skill to actually voyage across the horizon and come back with something different that didn't exist where you came from. And that was how you got prestige in these cultures in the Western Pacific. And no doubt it was the same kind of phenomenon which already existed in the Malay realm, say 2,000, 2,500 years ago. So, uh, and what did they do? One of the main things they took around was pottery. <laughs> there were only certain areas where they had good enough clay in Eastern Indonesia, excuse me, to make pottery. A lot of the islands here are coral atolls or volcanic, they don't have clay. And so they don't have sedimentary materials, you can't make pottery out of that. The Polynesians, once they got out to Hawaii, didn't make pottery anymore because there's no clay in Hawaii. So they made pottery, they took it as far east as just the Micronesian area, and that's where pottery stops. But it's known as Lapita, where the basic decorations of this early Pacific pottery are quite closely related to the southern Philippines, the Luku area. Uh, so they took pottery from some areas where there were specialized potters making large quantities of pottery to exchange for things like fish. And there was also a whole other cycle. There were two different cycles. One was the cycle of utilitarian objects, pottery for food. The other one was a cycle of uh, basic kinds of, of, of jewelry, seashells and um, big, um, big um, nautilus shells and things like that. So that was the theoretical justification for this long distance voyage and was to bring back seashells. And then you could bring them back and they were traded, uh, actually more often hereditarily inherited from one group to the next one. But once the kind of ceremonial relationships had been established with people in different other islands, you had like a trading partner, then you could trade on the side for things that you could actually make use of. And so that was the, the, the stimulating factor. So from an ecological point of view, it makes perfect sense. It kind of balances out periods when there's a, a droughts or a, other kinds of El Nino phenomena, let's say, when food is maybe kind of scarce in one area, you can balance it by having some kind of reserve area to call upon. So it does uh, give you some kind of survival value, even though you know the, the transfer of um, seashells around doesn't by itself have any positive adaptational advantage. But this is the kind of way human culture evolves. It evolves through art, essentially. Art has evolved, and through art, then various other kinds of communication becomes possible. So about 300, before the Common Era, say 2,300 years ago, there was already contact between Southeast Asia and China and India. But the evidence for this comes from archaeology, and particularly pottery. Western Han pottery has been found in southern Thailand now, as well as another type of pottery known as Romano-Indian related ware. So this trade began about 2,300 years ago, long before the transfer of Indian cultural items, such as writing, sculpture, temples. Those things didn't come in automatically. They were not just part of the beginnings of contact between Southeast Asia and India. They came in a later phase, no doubt when Southeast Asian societies had become sufficiently complicated, elaborate, and more evolved status systems, that then these other kinds of techniques then became useful to the elites of those regions. By about 2,000 years ago, the Mediterranean peoples had a vague idea of the geography of the Singapore area. This is a Latin map here, which was copied uh, during the um, Byzantine period, but it was based on older Alexandrian Greek sources. <coughs> 